and I'll uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, Sugi Kang. Sugi is a PhD candidate from the UBC. He's majoring in uh, computational geophysics. Sugi received his bachelor degree and master's degree in Hanyang University in Korea. Sugi is passionate about solving practical geophysical problems. And through his PhD research, he's tackling induced polarization effects in electromagnetic geophysics. The research may allow the first steps towards a new imaging technique to be used in the mining exploration industry. Um, through this work, he's been awarded the best student paper at two international conferences. Uh, much of Sugi's PhD output is captured in the open source SIMPEG project. Um, he's actively working on a framework on the framework design of new high performance algorithms as well as being involved in mentoring and bringing new contributors up to speed. Sugi has received a four year doctoral fellowship from the UBC. Welcome, Sugi. It was, it was made for a long time. <laughs> uh, I should have uh, sent a short bio. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. I'm Sagi. I'm going to talk about inversion of airborne geophysics over the T. Quite Chow Kimball complex. And that was our teamwork has been done in UBC for. Uh, past two or three years. Uh, there, there are three, uh, four key people, Sarah DeBries, Dominic Fournier, and Douglas Ordenberg, and myself. Let me start. Uh, yeah, in this talk, I'm going to use seven step procedure, what Doug is pretty passionate for. And uh, hey, like, we're going to start with setup, what is the background of geology, and what was the known information. We're seeing the physical properties in geophysics, so I'm going to introduce and we do geophysical surveys and get the data. We do inversion for processing, mainly, 3D inversion. And we need to interpret what's, what we've got. So we interpret our inverted wizard, and if you have some drilling information or what else, we could synthesize that. So we're going to work through our TKC case history with the seven steps. So set up, uh, in Canada, a lot of diamonds, as you guys know, uh, it's the third largest diamond producer. <coughs> And especially in Northwestern territories, there's a region called Lac de Grasse. And in the Lac de Grasse, there are Caddy, Lyavik, also T. Quai Cho, we usually call TKC. And that's our main focus of today. And in, in a T. Quai Cho, there's two um, Kimberlite pipes called DO18 and DO27. Is, it, is there like three that I can point to? Yeah. Edge of that little knob. Use the mouse thing. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we got two main pipes, and uh, we need to know a bit of geologies. So, uh, ah, there we go. Ah, perfect. <laughs> Okay. Uh oh. Ah, perfect. Okay. Um, so we need to know the <laughs> geologists and uh, kimberlite pipe. It's been placed in the granite post rock like this. And there are three main kimberlites uh, called hypobyssal HK, volcanoclastic VK, and pyroclastic PK. So what HK is an intrusive rock, igneous and non-fragmented. So it's more magnetic, magmatic rock. And the VK, a volcanic rock. Extrusive, more fragmental. And the PK is a sort of like a similar to VK, but more violent, and it actually exploded and deposited after that explosive event. So it may have more clays and more pore spaces compared to either HK and VK. Okay, so those are the Kimberlites. And then uh, there are two challenges that we actually have faced when dealing with this TKC project. Uh, a historical in 1992, uh, people flew with the DGEM survey, and uh, they actually found this survey with DGEM uh, survey, which was great for us. Like, I was pretty excited when I was started. Oh, they find with geophysics. And uh, that's actually the MAC data. They, it's measured at 1992 with the DGEM system. And they drilled actually this part upon this MAC data, and they were pretty disappointed because of the, of the low grade that they, what they've got. And now, 2016, 24 years later, the technology has developed a lot. So 3D inversion of mag and gravity, even EM, is now possible. 
So let's revisit that with fresh eyes and modern technologies. And now, can we ask, can urban geophysics actually help Kimberlite exploration programs? So that's our first challenge. And the second challenge was uh, they actually flew a lot of airborne time dominion system. So for example, that's Aerotem 2 data at 2003. And they measured like positive high anomalies, but there are a lot of negative transients in DO18 and DO27. At, at the time, it wasn't quite sure they can actually measure that. They sort of theoretically understood it could be possible due to the chargeable materials. And that was the reason why they flew a lot of airborne time dominium survey, AeroTEM 1, 2, and VTEM. Similarly now, can we, okay, at this point, can we actually handle this to recover 3D chargeability model at TKC? If then, is that polarization information that we can get in 3D can help Kimball exploration program. So those are two challenges that we want to visit in this talk. Okay, physical properties. We're in geophysics, as I said, we're seeing not actual geology itself, but we're seeing the physical property contrast that that geological unit have. So we need to know that well. Uh, so here's a table, but the important thing is like this. Over Kimballite usually have low density. And the HK, as I said, it's a magmatic unit, so it it could have high susceptibility, and also probably low density than the host rock. And VK and PK, it's sort of volcanic rock, and PK is especially is exploded and then deposited after. It will have lots of clay, so it will have moderate to high conductivity. So like different units have, could have different physical properties, and by exciting the Earth in a different geophysical methodologies, we can actually see that. So a lot of the urban survey has been done. Uh, in 1992, DGM, it's a frequency dominium system, Falcon Gravity Radiometry Third Survey, 2001, Aerotem 2, 2003, it's a time dimension system, and VTEM in 2004. Lots of error survey. But I, like, there are probably more. I haven't that put all the things in, but those are the examples, and that's where the locations are. So let's look at the data. So lots of error surveys are done. Uh, we're going to start from DGM data. It's a little bit broader scale compared to the others. Uh, so that's EM data at 7200 hertz quadrature component. It's a frequency domain data, so we have uh, in phase and quadrature phase and lots of different frequencies. Actually, there are only three frequencies. Sorry about that. Uh, look at this data. So there are two bullseyes, and that's what they see in 992. And I think their mind was blown. Oh, okay, there's, there is some Kimball waves. Uh, so there are two bullseyes. That means like we have a two like a conductive material at the 018 and the 027. That's what we can. And the MAC data, it's a little bit different, but you see lots of dikes, but if you actually look at the Google map, you can see a lot of dikes going on on the surface, which is not very interesting in a mining perspective. Uh, but like this one was interesting, so that was the susceptibly high anomaly. So DO27 could be pr pretty much susceptible. Now, but the interesting is here, that region, so we zoom in. If you look at the MAC data from VTIM system, that looks like that. So that's actually pretty similar to DGM MAC data. So now we're seeing same MAC data, but in a different system. Uh, so you see, like if I pick the one anomaly high, you can see the DO27 is pretty high. <coughs> and the gravity radiometry data is measured as well. And you see this negative anomalies in overall DO18 and DO27. So you can sort of get the idea, OK, there are a lot of like, uh, less dense materials in this region. And I picked the highest, uh, high, like some values, like high values for susceptibility anomaly. And they're sort of in a similar location, but not, they're not exactly the same, which meaning we're seeing some different things in a, in a different surface, which is good. And the EM data, so there was a potential field data. And the DGM data, we have seen two conductive anomalies. But AeroTEM2 at 2003, it's actually pretty different. At DO27, we're sort of seeing similar positive high anomaly from the conductor, but we're seeing negative transients at that, at that location. 2004 VTEM, we can actually see pretty similar result at the same location. So now we're kind of, uh, our confidence level is going higher and higher. Okay, we're doing multiple surveys, we're seeing that. And actually, in 1993, they did the ground nanotem uh, survey. It's actually, in the geometry wise, it's pretty similar because you have a ground loop, and then you have a, uh, like a DVD-T receiver measuring the Z component. So that's actually similar, but on the ground. 
So you can see the similar response. So yeah, there's no question that there are a lot of chargeable materials at TKC region just by looking at this data. Okay, so that was the data, and we're gonna process this data, but we're gonna use mostly inversion, 3D inversion technique, and uh, we're minimizing this objective function, we have data misfit, that we have a regularization, like we're using a kind of Tikhonov style regularization, having smallness and smoothness. So we mostly use UBC code for gravity, mag, and EM inversions, and for the IP inversion, I use uh, open source impact code. Okay, so we got the inversion code, let's do the inversion. And we picked the VTAM MEG data because VTAM has the tight line spacing, like tight line spacing compared to the other. So that's more data, it's dense uh, data density. So that's the MAG data. If we invert that in 3D, that's the susceptibility model that we've got. There actually have some remnants, so there are a lot of processing involved in what Sarah and Chris did, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about that details, but that's the result we've got. And uh, yeah, we got susceptible body at the 027 and slightly moderately susceptible body at the 018. So we can get three model. Good. And we got the gravity geometry data, we invert it by using 3D code as well. And we can get like a low density volume in 3D. But we're actually, I picked this dotted line is from uh, the susceptibility model. And that's actually a little bit different location where we see low density anomalies in 3D. <coughs> okay. So we can do that. And then if I pick a couple contour and then move it back to here in the anomaly contours, it looks like this. So this uh, olive color is from the density, which is showing probably overall low density volume. And then this purple color is moderate susceptibility, yellow is high susceptibility. So now in 3D level, we can actually see different volumes having different physical properties. So we're sort of narrowing down what is in there in a TKC region. Okay, let's move on to EM inversion. Uh, so we're gonna focus on DGEM and VTEM data. It's kind of reasonable, DGEM is one frequency domain system and VTEM is time domain system. We're sort of doing both of them. And the challenge, remember, the negatives in VTEM data. And, well, you could see that. And, like, let's start with DGEM data. And this is actually, a different from, difference from the potential field data, we have a multiple frequency or a multiple time in EM data, which has a better resolution. So, it's a quadrature component, 900, 7200, and 556K hertz. As you go higher frequency, we're actually seeing more shallower part compared to the lower frequency. And the trend is actually different. And that meaning, like we're seeing different Earth, so it actually has a depth resolution. Just kidding. And move on to time domain data. So that was the frequency domain DGM data and 130 microseconds. That's relatively early time channel. It, I think that was probably uh, second or third. And then as you go later time channels, this guy is actually changing a lot. And like eight more later, it actually converts to negatives. So there are a lot of <coughs> negatives, meaning there are a lot of chargeable materials in this DKC region. So if I pick those, I can pick these four different anomalies, A1 to A3 at all your time channels, I can pick that. And this positive high anomaly at A4 is changed to negative anomalies. So we can actually see four different negative, like chargeable anomalies at TKC region. And if I pick four stations, and plot the time decaying curve, that looks like that. So those three are A1 to A3, which is from here, and that's A4, which is less, like some positive, then to convert to uh, negatives. So there, here's, we have some hope. Okay, there are probably some different chargeable materials, and we have some chance that we can distinguish that in a 3D space. So that's our hope, just from the data. And why this negative transient induced polarization is happening, definitely because of the complex conductivity. For example, Pendleton's cold cold model could be written as like that. It has some parameters, uh, conductivity at infinite frequency, chargeability, time constants, and frequency dependency. And then we can write that as, we can plot it in frequency domain, or we can transform that into time, then conductivity will be a function of time. Okay. And that's sort of a mathematical representation of IP effects. Okay, then how, what is, but we're not actually measuring that, we're measuring 
EM data. So we need to uh, understand what's happening on our EM data. So here's our setup, VTEM setup, and that's sort of like a kind of reflection of the uh, diamond pi uh, Kimberlite pipe cylinder. And the uh, conductivity of the background is pretty resistive. 10 to the minus 4, I put the 10 to the minus 1 Siemens per meter for the chargeable body, which is more conductive. And I put some cold cold parameters. And I put the VTEM waveform, and then we can do the simulation with this stuff. <coughs> and here, F is a Maxwell's operator. What it does, if I pass the conductivity, it computes uh, DVD-T data that I want to see. So if I pass uh, conductivity, which is a function of time, then that'll compute both EM and IP facts. That's what we could measure. But if I pass conductivity at infinite frequency, so this guy is not time dependent, and that'll compute standalone EM effect. So that's our reference, and then if we subtract this fundamental responses, what we call, to, from observed responses, we can get the IP datum, which is red color. So that's the simulated result for this setup. And the black is the observed, including both EM and IP, and the blue is the fundamental. And by subtracting fundamental from black, we can get the IP data. So now that dotted line means all negatives. Okay. And in only time, uh, observed and fundamental is pretty similar, meaning EM is dominant. But as you go later time channels, IP is getting dominant. So in, in time, there is a natural separation between EM and IP facts, which is a good feature to remember. Okay. And can you see that in the real data? Yes. So, but like there's a different level. At A4, we're sort of seeing this full kind of spectrum, but for A1 to A3, we're actually just seeing this part, late time, where IP is dominant. And that could be a pretty challenging. Say, you have all negatives, there's no time channel that you can invert for connectivity. So that's kind of challenge that we need to deal with. Okay, to do that, we're gonna use TM IP inversion workflow. So th the output will be both conductivity and the chargeability model in 3D. So first step is we invert time dominion data. We need to choose uh, this part where we don't have that much IP facts. But fortunately, we got DGM data, meaning like, because like this part, all of your data is negative, so there's no time channel that I, that I can invert for conductivity, which is challenging. But we got this DGM data, we can cooperatively invert this two data set and then recover a 3D conductivity model. For VTEM data, we ignored all, all the pot, all the negative transients that we know this is actually from IP. And, but for DGM data, we actually use it, all, all the data. And that's the conductivity model that we recovered, which is pretty uh, nice. And we got two conductors. And DO18 is actually uh, uh, like exposed to the surface, but DO18 is imaged at depth, which is interesting. And we got the conductivity model. So we put that into our Maxwell's operator, compute the fundamental response, and then subtract it back from the observation, then we can get the IP data. So that's the fundamental, that's our observed data. By subtracting this from the observed, we can get the IP data. So we're actually effectively removing this positive EM effect in, in the observed data, and we can get the IP data much better. So now we got the IP data, and we can, well, like invert in nonlinear fashion, but we can linearize that. And we actually wrote a paper about that, so there are lots of details, because it's a little bit different uh, uh, from the CIP case, because we're inductively exciting the system, and that is actually effectively captured on our paper. So if you're interested, you can have a look. And we did, the, we did that, and we can recover 3D pseudo chargeability uh, at certain time channels. So the IP that ha that has a multiple time channels and we're inverting in, in a separate time separately, so we're going to get, uh, we're going to recover pseudo chargeability at multiple time channels, and this is one example. Okay? Uh, okay, so let's look at that. So we got, we inverted all the time channels, and we can recover pseudo chargeability at each time channel. I'm showing you uh, at 130 microseconds, so that was observed, fundamental, and that's IP data. So we inverted this data, recovered uh, this pseudo chargeability uh, in, in 3D. So that uh, yellow, uh, white line is actually shows the conductivity anomalies, and we image it at DO18 and some DO27 and, and at A2 location as well, and that's the section view at DO18 and DO27. Okay? Now we move on to later time channels. So we're seeing actually different IP data, right? This A4 is coming up. That's kind of like reasonable we can image this 
uh, high chargeable body at DO27. And that red line is actually from uh, the Oli time, so I call like the Oli pseudo chargeability. So we can sort of distinguish in DO27, there are two different chargeable bodies, maybe. And also we can distinguish DO18 and DO27. Okay, and it's not the end. The final step, that pseudo chargeability, as it said, that's pseudo information. But we want in intrinsic information about uh, uh, polarization. So what we do, we recovered kind of pseudo chargeability in 3D but in time, so that's a 4D space. So if I pick one pixel, it is a, it is a, it is a function of time. So I can parameterize that as a function of cocal parameters, and I can set up an inverse problem, invert for each pixel, and I can recover some uh, intrinsic parameters. So I picked, I, don't, I didn't put, I didn't invert all the cells, I picked a couple anomalies, A1 to A4, and inverted, and uh, I picked the median values and plotted in time, so that's like, these are A1 to A3, and those are A4. And recovered charge, like tau, uh, time constant chargeability is plotted in the cross plot, so that's a time constant and that's chargeability. And you can see at least A1 and A4, they are very different. A4 has much greater tau compared to A1, meaning we can distinguish different chargeable materials. Uh, so if I summarize, like that's a connectivity, all these pseudo chargeability, late pseudo chargeability, if I put that into anomaly plot, that looks like that. So we're seeing this red and the green so we're distinguishing in 3D space in a different uh, chargeable materials. And that those are mostly in a conductive uh, anomaly. So now we're moving on to interpretation. We got a lot of 3D volumes. So we need to put that into our interpretation. And remember, the overall Kimball light has low density. HK has high susceptibility. VK and PK has kind of moderate susceptibility but high conductivity. So that's known information. And let's do the interpretation. So that those are from uh, both uh, density and the susceptibility anomalies, and we can make a rock model like this. We, now we are getting three rock model, R1, R1, uh, R0, R1, R2. So R1 is low density, which is this guy, mostly from density, and moderate susceptibility. R2 is low density, but high susceptibility. So R2 may be close to HK. And R1 might be PK or VK because they have uh, low density and moderate susceptibility. Now we, we add the conductivity model. And yeah, that looks like the, the green one, uh, the blue one. And R3 now, it, it doesn't add too much, but we can uh, kind of set R3 is low density, moderate susceptibility, and high conductivity. Okay. Now we add chargeable parameters which was all the chargeability and late chargeability. All the chargeability is mostly from red one and the late chargeability was the green one. There are lots of colors and pretty. Uh, and then we're distinguishing more rock units. So we actually added R4 and R5 here. And, and the question was like, okay, we probably can distinguish PK and VK, but we, we don't know which is what. So can we, can we kind of interpret it in a way? So that was my question, and so here's my interpre our interpretation. So PK, we know that that is deposited, the difference between PK and VK, that is deposited after an explosive event. So it will have more pore space, probably more clays, and that like, we know that like, if you have a more pore space or greater grain size, time constant is going to be bigger. So R4 has a smaller tau, that could be VK, and then R5, which has a greater tau, would be PK. So that's our interpretation, and those are our rock units, R0 to R5, and that's our interpretation of post rock, HK, PK, and VK. So we, we, that's our final interpretation. And we're moving on to synthesis. Well, there are lots of drilling has been done in this location. We know a lot of information. So now let's use that, because we didn't use it before. Uh, the one big question was, okay, that I haven't mentioned, but is actually con con like conductivity anomaly that we see in DGM and airborne data is actually from the conductor or from the till? There was a big question, but like this 3D inversion actually tells us it's actually from the conductor. And as I shown from that DGM data, we, we have that resolution in the data, so we're actually 
uh, properly doing the inversion, we can actually get this information. So we answer that. So it's actually from the conductor. And finally, we want to compare, that's our petrophysical model from geophysics without too many, too much uh, geological information or drilling research. And here's our 3D geology model from drillings. So that we actually, they got, that, that black dot's actually all the drilling points. I haven't plotted here because it's, it looks very messy. Um, and actually there are five, so actually one, two, three, four, six units, host rock, tail, HK, XVK, VK, and PK. So I made it like the same color, what we've got. Except for XVK, we've got most, most of the units from our geophysics, which is pretty amazing. And the interesting part, like, okay, we image it, we sort of delineate HK, PK, and VK, except for bottom part, because there are some, there could be some issues how, how deep we can see from, even, even for EM, because it's an airborne, we're limited, and gravity and mag, it doesn't quite have really intrinsic depth resolution. And, but interestingly, DO18 is actually detected by all of airborne geophysics, which is really interesting part. Okay. So we did a pretty good job. Uh, and if you look at the 3D volume, and that's our interpretation, and that's, our, that's actually the 3D geological model from the drilling. So to conclude, uh, we have inverted airborne geophysical databases at TKC, MAC, Gravity, EM, and IP. So we recovered five uh, different physical properties, and we actually effectively handled challenges <coughs> in IP effects in time dominion data by applying TMIP inversion workflow. And the recovered polarization information actually helped to distinguish different Kimberlite, especially for PK and VK, which was a good information. And uh, I want to emphasize no explicit geological information use. So we're focusing on, okay, how, how much can we push uh, from just the geophysics side to get the interpretation? Um, so, and then we obtained a 3D rock model that, uh, which is pretty close to uh, the geological model that was from drilling. But uh, as actually Nick, I, I was mind blown from Nick's presentation, but what if we have some drilling information? What if we have a, one boring M survey were available at like that location? I'm pretty sure we could do much better. Ah, thank you very much. Thanks, Sugi. We got time for a couple of questions. Excellent presentation. Uh, I did note, I'm glad you commented on the depth sensitivities because that's important. It's whenever you're looking at the uh, multi parameters, they've all got different depth sensitivities. So you're kind of limited by the one that's seeing uh, the shallowest depths. And in, that, in this case, it looks like it's the IP. Uh, do you think that the IP is fundamentally limited in its depth of penetration? It looks like it's getting to about half the depth of uh, the, the EM data set. Yes, so I, I think like the, the, that's sort of like the, I don't know, a little bit negative side of the IP, everyone IP. Uh, it, like, I, I still think we can, you can still see something in depth but compared to conductivity inversion, you have a less depth resolution. That's my opinion. I have a question, Sugi. And perhaps you can ex well, explain or tell me why you think the frequency domain response was a conductor and it didn't really seem to respond too much to IP effects. And then when you compare that to the early time V10 mm -hmm. data that was responding yeah. DO18 especially, yeah. Can you talk on the difference there? Uh, yeah, kind of like the like if you think about like we're, if you have a full frequency and time band, we're gonna see like we need to see same things. But what the DGM, well, we got three frequency, nine hundred fifty six k or seventy two fifty six k. What that they are saying is probably much higher frequency band compared to the V10 case. So V10 late time channels is actually seeing much lower frequency band, I guess. So if you sampled the V10 at a much earlier channel, in theory you think it would be... Yeah, so if you, if I, like, I haven't shown, but the, if I actually see the nano 10 data, it has much earlier time channel compared to V10 data, I can see really similar response from DGM and, and the nano 10 data. So they are actually seeing similar things. 